Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the early career immunology seminar series. Um, thank you for your continued support. Just a reminder to everyone that today's seminar will be recorded. We are excited to have Santiago Carmona with us today. Santiago obtained his PhD in biotechnology in 2015 from the University of San Martin in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he pioneered the application of peptide macroarrays to characterize pathogen-specific antibody repertoires, leading to improved diagnosis for Chagas disease. Part of his doctoral studies were conducted at the Technical University of Denmark and at La Jolla Institute USA as a Fulbright Fellow. In 2016, he joined the University of Lausanne in Switzerland as a postdoc to study immune cell diversity in zebrafish. In 2019, Santiago established his research group at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research and part of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. He's working at the crossroads of data science, single cell omics, and cancer immunology, with his team developing and applying computational methods to understand how our immune system responds to cancer and to identify new therapeutic targets and disease biomarkers. If you have a question for Santiago, please save this for the end of his talk and type them into the chat. Santiago, thank you for joining today. We are looking forward to hearing from you. I don't hear you, Santiago. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. Thank you so much, Cecil, for the introduction and for this invitation, and the, the whole team, the committee team for for organizing. It's a lot of work for organizing this this great series. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. So yeah, first I would like to introduce. The, my amazing colleagues, um, Massimo Andriata and Paul Gegan. So we are a computational biology lab. Uh, we, we develop computational methods by informatics tools with a focus on understanding the immune response in cancer. We are located in Lausanne. It's a beautiful city in Switzerland by the Lake of Geneva or Lake Le Mans. With a, uh, we can see the, the, the Swiss Alps. And we are located in this um, uh, Agora. It's a new, new, new research center. It's called Agora. Cancer Research Center. And so if you don't know about it, so the, this institute gathers basic and, and clinician scientists with a focus on, on cancer uh, research. So you might recognize some, some of the faces. So nowadays, uh, single cell sequencing technologies are one of the most powerful tools or assays to characterize uh, immune response in a, in a complex tissue. And in particular, single cell transcriptomics are now mature technologies and generate reproducible readouts. As a result of this, this maturity, we see a, this exponential increase of applications and accumulation of publicly available data. And these are open new opportunities to learn immunology by mining this data. So in this context, computational methods for single cell analysis play a critical role. So today I will focus on this um, on more than in specific immunology results, I will focus on the computational some some methods that we developed and how we use them actually to to in, to interpret the data to to learn immunology. One one key problem or question is when you, when we do a single cell sequencing um, experiment is to identify and or annotate cell populations. So for this problem. Usually there are three, generally speaking, three approaches. Uh, the first one is to uh, identify the differential expressed genes between clusters of cells that are transcriptionally similar, and then followed by a manual interpretation of this uh, list of differential expressed genes. The second approach, more targeted, is to evaluate predefined marker genes or gene signatures uh, based on, on, on prior information that we have, for instance, for this specific tissue. And a third one is to use automatic cell classifiers. So the first approach is largely exploratory. It's great for doing exploratory analysis, but it's not so great for final annotation of populations because this is heavily dependent on the cluster definitions that are uh, that can change substantially depending on which parameters or, or choices we, we choose. So let's focus on this um, second approach that is based on using predefined marker genes. Let's, for, for instance, consider these data sets of PBMC. 
and we want to identify where are the T cells here. So we can verify an expression of T cell markers such as CD2, CD3, and CK. These are probably T cells. And because this single cell transcriptomics data is generally sparse and also is noisy, it is generally also useful to combine expression of multiple markers together to make a signature that is usually more, more sensitive. So for this particular task, we use a tool that we developed that is called UCell. Here is a, just a piece of code to see how, how easy it is to run. This is using in the, in the popular Surat framework. And I include this because I think it's very useful, like uh, in general, like um, people in the lab um, that engage in programming and, and, and can uh, exchange code with bioinformaticians. So, Let's now continue with another example. If you focus in NKs, for instance, let's, let's see KLRD1 is an NK marker. So we could check expression of KLRD1 and see, okay, maybe this population here is positive. And we can here use a similar approach as those using flow cytometry and check expression of these markers and say, okay, I, I, I would like to isolate the cells that are KLRD1 high, but CD3 low to target this population. Here, there's an additional trick that is there is a smoothing behind this of the user scores so that to so that each cell can somehow benefit from expression of very similar cells also as another strategy to overcome the sparsity of the data. So and doing this is very important because in we need to define discrete populations to make sense of complex data. So uh, analyzing signatures is a great approach. But at the same time, if we are going to characterize a complex system, we need to define subsets and subtypes and groups in order to make sense of the, of the, the global picture. So for this particular task, we developed another tool that is called single cell gate that automatizes this, this process of marker-based population annotation. So in this case, we will we will you, you, we could define a simple what you call a gating model that is KLR D1 positive, CD3 D negative, for instance, and this was isolate these cells and this is again it's, it's very simple it can be running in one line of code where, or, or in this case in two where in one you would define your gating model the combination the so positive and negative marker gene and then you would apply the gate um, algorithm to isolate this population some other cases uh, would be more more can be arbitrary challenging to use markers to define this so and an alternative approach is to use a hierarchical structure to define the models, also something that is, is similar to the, to the practice in flow cytometry. For, so for instance, one could first isolate immune cells from, from a data set at, at a second level, only focusing subset, subsetting first this compartment, isolating the lymphoid compartment, as I hear we're using specific markers at each level. At a third level, for instance, a pan B cell isolation, and finally, uh, let's say a plasma cell. So in this way, we, we could reach with a very high precision to this isolation of plasma cells. We could also have done it with in one level, but, it's the, but, but in this case, it's to explain how we could do this in a more sensitive way. And also this, this package comes already, this tool, comes with predefined gating models, so for out of the out of the box uh, multi-class annotation, and we we did a, 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 a small comparison with other tools and and this uh, this way of classifying outperform other state of the art classifiers, and this more importantly this is a transparent and reproducible cell type annotation strategy using marker genes, so it's much clearer to to say what you're talking about when you refer to specific markers rather than talking about complex uh, transcriptional profiles. So what, what I told you uh, up to here is that broad cell types can be consistently defined, for instance, using marker genes and using tools such as single cell gate. But obviously, the, this, at a high granularity, uh, things can get more complicated. So this is an example of a data set that is composed of, this is human uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte from lung uh, tumors. And here at this level of resolution, um, we see that in addition to these cell types, there are continuing states, con continuous differentiation states, like intermediate or, or transitional states that are possible because uh, at this level we can also have plasticity. And there are also transient gene programs, for instance, cell division or response to interferons tend to be 
strong trans uh, programs that express very very strongly in a, in, a, in a transcriptional profiles, and also at this higher resolution, batch effects and choice of parameters also have a stronger impact and start to confound more strongly the cell specific signals, the cell type specific signals. So as a result of this, in general, this results in largely uh, subjective and time consuming annotations. And at a more macro level, this results in annotations being inconsistent across studies. So it's nowadays it's very challenging to know in different studies and papers what are we talking about because we come in the, the, the definition of different immune cell populations, even just here talking about T cells become uh, challenging and, and there is not a, a consistent system to, to organize them. So to, to try to solve this problem, we implemented a, a, an approach that uh, it's a reference-based approach where the idea is that first we build a curated uh, map and then we use it as a reference to interpret other data set in this, in this uh, consistent uh, system of coordinates. And this has two, uh, let's say, um, outputs. Like one is the automatic classification. So we would get a label for cells in a, in a data set. But uh, so this, in, in this sense, this could be or operate as a, as a classifier. But as we see, this also enables another kind of analysis that is to directly compare the query cells, the, the cells in the new data set in the context of the reference. So I will show you uh, with, a, with, with some examples uh, about, about what, what this is about. So for instance, consider this, this is a reference that we build, these are mouse tiles. We have here different subtypes, now we are not going into the details, but now we want to use this this reference map to interpret an external data set. Let's say uh, this, this uh, two more specific CDA tils from a, from another study. In this case, from Miller and colleagues. And so now we can take this data and use this uh, this tool that is called Project Tils to to now embed this new data into our reference map. And we can see now here in black and in these contour lines of high density cells where these cells have been projected. How this and, and this actually this projection is not only here we see a let's say a low dimensional representation this is a U map but this actually the embedding also happens in the high dimensional uh, space and then we can also check how the profiles of the projected cells in this area of what we call here the the terminally exhausted CDA tils how they compare to the reference so here in yellow is the projected cells these are the two more specific tetramer isolated cells compared to the ones in black that are part of our reference. We can also now go back to some of the studies, human studies I showed before. And now we can take, for instance, different clusters of, uh, of, um, of, of the, for instance, the, this study here, these are, I think it's basal cell carcinoma from Yost and colleagues. And we can project each of these into our reference map to see how these relate to the cells that we know in our map. So for instance, we can take this exhausted cluster and project it into our map and see, okay, we have a good correspondence here, again, with what the authors here annotated as exhausted cells with what we found in our map. And we can again compare the reference profiles. In this case, it's just a selection of, of important marker genes, but obviously we could look at any of these genes. And we can do the same for the others. For instance, these T follicular helper cells or this cluster that was called effector memory that again matched to this effector memory in mouse. And we can also see cases where the, uh, as this one of this cluster of what has been called activated T cells that in fact, what we found is that it's highly heterogeneous and mat match at least to two populations. So it can also identify um, other sources of um, variation that are not necessarily, or, or clustering that is not necessarily associated with the phenotype. So about this uh, projection of human and mouse data, we, we did a, 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 a global analysis and projecting a large number of patients and, and mouse uh, data sets into the map. And what we found is that transcriptional profiles of these subtypes cluster, um, cl cluster by, so, so of these cells cluster by subtype and not by the cancer type of species, meaning that these, these major uh, TIL subtypes are largely conserved between human and mouse. What I will do now is to go a bit, show some examples, more in-depth analysis of a reference-based approach. And in this case, 
I'm going to use as an example the SEMB model. Uh, this is one of the most studied models for T cell responses, so it's uh, it's a good place to 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 find where there is more light. In this case, there are two two main strains of the virus that are used: the Armstrong strain that that produces an acute uh, infection that will be naturally resolved, and then there is a clone 13 strain that will establish a chronic infection, and then. We, we generated maps for both CD8 T cell response and CD4 T cell response of, of virus specific using tetramer with these uh, uh, LCMB uh, uh, epitopes. So now we, we're going again to use this as an example of the kind of analysis we can do, and we will do it with the CD4 T cell uh, response. So for this project, this was, a, this was a, a very nice collaboration with Thomas Tucci that was at the University of Rochester. And he uh, isolated uh, virus specific CD4 T cells from the two uh, infection models, the acute and the chronic at different time points and generated single cell RNA-seq paired with TCR sequencing. Uh, here today, I will not talk about the, the, the results of the TCR sequencing analysis, uh, partly what is the association of a clonotype and differentiation, and but this is published work, so if you are interested, you can check it there. So now what we're going to do is to focus on the T-cell diversity and how to use this to to interpret additional data sets, as I mentioned. So the, the, the this is a transcriptional map that we build based on, based on LCMB-specific uh, cells from both acute and chronic infection at different time points. So we are not, again, going into the details here, So, the, but the three major or, or most abundant populations are these TH1 effector cells, T follicular helpers, and central memory. And there are very, for this, there are very clear temporal patterns. As you can see here, for instance, in an early acute time point, basically you have a, 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 mostly the populations are dominated by TH1 cells, T follicular helpers, and central memory precursor cells. And then we see how this progress in time you know, to, to, the, to the later time points and where there's a strong replacement of these populations by memory populations, mostly in this case, central memory populations. This is quite different from the context of the chronic infection, where initially there is, a, there is already a, um, a stronger enrichment in TFH compared to the acute, and this gets further um, uh, biased in the, in the later time point. We see a, a further increase in the TFH component and a reduction of the of the TH1 compared to the to the um, to the TFH, and so this is at, talking at at a global level. And there were also some let's say subtype specific changes that were associated in particular with chronicity and and dysfunction. Uh, if you're interested, you can you can check the the publication. But again, what you are going to do now is now to use this as a reference to see how we can interpret external data. And now that we generated this this uh, reference subtypes uh, uh, states. So this is one exam interesting example to try to interpret the impact of immunotherapies on CD4 T cells. This is a, a very nice study from uh, Laura Snell and colleagues from a recent publication, Nature Immunology, where they treated. Uh, chronically infected mice with uh, anti pdl one So what we're going to do now is uh, to project the data from the two conditions in our map to see how we can interpret this, these results. So in this case, the, the, there was a, a, a clear pattern where we see that compared to the isotype control, the anti pdl one treatment induced an, a shift from TFH to TH1. This is uh, in line with the observations in, in the paper. And also in, importantly, what we can see is how well the profiles of the projected data match with those of the reference. And here again, this is a place where we can also ask uh, that um, what are the differences within each. Once we have control for the major variation, the different subtypes, we can then ask more detailed questions of, of, of more subtype specific changes. I mean, this this you can check also in the in the publication. Another example is about interpreting genetic perturbation. So, as you may know, BLIM1 and the codes for, for uh, is coded by, by um, PRDM1. It's a transcription factor that is critical for TH1 differentiation. It has an antagonistic function with BCL6 that is a critical factor also for TFH differentiation. So, in this case, uh, 
Thomas and, and colleagues they generated this uh, activation in uh, induced uh, depletion uh, constructions of these transcription factors, and they generated um, th they sequenced these cells at day seven after infection. So now we are going to project these cells in our map to see how they behave. And this so this is a control which matches very well what we have. This is a wall a wall type control at day seven, and as expected, we see these these three major populations. And this is what happens, for instance, when you knock out BLIMB1, which is critical of TH1, you see that basically this population now is depleted and you have a strong uh, bias towards the TFH. And this is even more striking in the case of the PCL6 knockout, where the TFH now population is completely depleted and you have a very strong bias towards the TH1 state. Here then, we as, as, as we show you that when we do an unsupervised analysis, there are some transgene programs, for instance, the, the cell division that really drives the formation of clusters and, and the diversity. And this is, most of the time, we are not interested in those clusters because we, what we like is to, uh, to separate clusters that have different functions that we know, for instance, TH1 and TFH, and not just put into other cells because they are clustering. So one question that we ask is now, this is, if this is an unsupervised analysis of, a, of an external data set from Katrin and colleagues, from also recent papers, from um, this is a, yeah, for acute inf LCME infection at day 10. This is what happens if you do an unsupervised um, analysis of the data. As, as usual, you will find a cluster that is composed of cycling cells. And again, this is what we think is that it's not very useful to have this level of um, annotation and instead if you now take these cells and project into our, into our reference map what we can see is that in fact these proliferating cells th there are mainly composed of th1 but there are also uh, uh, in, in important fractions of tfh and in even t-rex and that this match very well the profiles of the reference so by, by having a, a, a robust reference you can project data uh, cells that even though they are expressing some specific programs they can be let's say sorted or, or annotated according to the, the to the to the subtype uh, in, in, a, in irrespective of this of this program that can be then analyzed as we can see here for instance expression of M, M, uh, mk67 uh, at, at a downstream part of the analysis next something i don't mention is the, that our reference was built completely from spleen from from cd 4 is taken from spleen and there are obviously a lot of diversity that is not present in the spleen. So in this case, we, we try to assess how we can use, or, or, or the, if it can could explain this this uh, map built from T cells from spleen, explain diversity in other tissues. So for for do this test, we use data from generated by the lab of Carolyn King that they, they use a model of influenza of a flu in mouse. And here, the, um, they sequenced uh, tissue resident memory uh, virus specific, so influenza specific CD4 T cells from different tissues. So we took this data and projected into our map to see if we could interpret, even though these were taken from different tissues, if we could interpret this diversity. So this is these are the result of the projection. So these are three different time points at day 9, 14, 30 from lymph node, and this from lung. And by doing this projection and classification, what we could see is that uh, in the in the lymph node we see this uh, strong enrichment in TFH populations that is re relatively stable in time. Whereas in the lung there is a there is a strong shift from initial time point of where the, there was a strong enrichment in in a TH1 population that is typical from non lymphoid tissues that changes actually into a TFH population in the lung. And this is super interesting and is part of the, the results that they, 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 they the findings that they describe in their paper uh, about the T resident helper cells that promote human responses in the lung. And even though these are cells that can be uh, classified in, in, in these different subtypes, there are also some tissue specific signals. So this is a, 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 tissue, spe a, a tissue residency signal that signature that they have identified in their, in their paper. And here we can verify that this signature, for instance, uh, CREM is one of these transcription factors that is specific of this uh, lung that is upregulated 
irrespective of this of this of the subtype so that there are this is very interesting because it means that there are some programs such as specific tissue assessing programs that can be activated on top of the of the let's say subtype defining programs and that these kind of analysis help us to 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 separate these these differences source of uh, these different source of uh, signals and then we did an, another experiment that is now that, that if we know that uh, a particular uh, cell state is not present in our reference, how can we deal with this problem? So in this case, we tried to use our reference map that was for virus specific disease to interpret um, another system, in this case, a tumoral system. So what we did is to project two more specific CD4 T cells into the virus specific reference map. This is also a data, data that has been generated by, by Thomas Tucci in, in University of Rochester, and he isolated GP66 specific CD4 T cells, isolated from tumors and from draining lymph nodes from MC38 uh, expressing GP66 uh, epitope. And here what we could see by projecting, by projecting this into the reference map is that the lymph nodes, we, we, we observe a, a large fraction of uh, uh, T follicular helpers and of T rex. Well, in the tumor, we observe a, a larger fraction of T rex and also a fraction of cells that are not predicted as TH1. However, when we go, when we check the profiles, the gene expression profiles, we already see that, for instance, the TH1 effector is losing an important uh, gene, a CCL5 expression. So we look more into details. One, one thing that is very nice that we can do in this kind of analysis is that we, now we can compare, for instance, the, 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 the tumor T helper and um, th the tumor cells that projected in this area with those of the viral infection for the reference map. And we can see which genes are discriminant between them. So we see that CCL5 indeed is, is uh, differentially expressed associated in the viral, but not in the tumor. But we also see here a strong enrichment in TH2 genes, for instance, IL5, 13, CCL8, et cetera. Meaning that this is uh, suggesting that this, uh, this uh, tumor specific uh, intratumoral CD4 T cell state is, has a, has a shift toward TH2 uh, function compared to the viral case. And another way to, to look into this uh, from, uh, let's say, the, the reference-based analysis is that now we can, we can because the, now the query cells, the, the tumor cells and the, and the reference are in the same space, so now we can analyze them together and we can, for instance, redo the clustering and redo the dimensionality reduction. And if we do this, what we can say, in fact, is that this cluster of two more TH2-like cells emerge as a separate cluster. So this is also a way of how we can evolve a reference map from one initial condition, how we, we can evolve it to include additional variation that was not initially present. In any case, this, identifying what is new and what's not, uh, what, what is novel in, in terms of cellular states is, is a challenging problem. So there's no, uh, say, an easy solution. And we have a, a number of metrics and diagnostics that we use to address this, that, or, or some tools that we give to the, to, the re to the researcher to decide to what extent a, a projected population is novel or is already uh, well interpreted. So I mentioned already three of them. And there is also the, the, the classifier confidence that give you a score that can be useful and also st cell state silhouette coefficient that is these are implemented in the project deal pipeline. And this all together can give you uh, a good idea about the, the novelty or, or agreement of a projected cells into the map. So as I, sh as I have shown you, um, we say that uh, Signature scoring is a very useful uh, approach to, to measure these signals. And, and here we, we use a, uh, at our tool called UCEL. And for automatic classifier, we could use whenever possible. It's better to use a marker base because this is very transparent and clear. However, in, in a, again, in a, a more challenging problems and more subtle signals, a reference based approach um, can be. Uh, more convenient. So again, here I include a, a line of code that can be very straightforward to run from a Surat object to run projectiles analysis, selecting the reference where you want to make the projection. And here you will find many tutorials that hopefully can help you um, to, if you're planning to run this analysis with many examples and also where well, you can always reach out for, for specific help. 
So one important thing that this automatic classification, either marker based or reference map based, is that it enables, as I mentioned, to start mining the large amount of data that is publicly available. So I will show you some work on progress from Paul uh, that he has uh, taken public data of cancer patients, single cell transcriptomics data of cancer patients. So here he uh, isolated 234 samples that has a relatively large that should have at least 100 CDA T cells because this is a meta-analysis of CDA T cells. This comes from 22 cancer cell types. And this is a, a reference map of human CDA T cells that he generated and then now can be used to interpret this, this external data. And here we, we are only going to focus about the main the out, output of the projection that is the subtype classification. So this is an example from one tumor. So we have here, uh, in this case, it's enriched in, in, in terminally exhausted CDA T cells and there's this, this precursor of exhausted population and vector memory. So now one way of looking at all the 234 samples together in terms of different composition is to do a correspondence analysis. Uh, this is a B plot of correspondence analysis that put together subtype and samples. So here we can read also how not only how subtypes are associated in the samples, but also what is the structure of the of the of the samples. And here the colors are associated with the tissue of origin. So some samples were directed from the tumor, others from adjacent tissue and, and, and also others from blood. So what, one thing that we can read about this analysis is that, for instance, the tissue is, as, as we, one could expect, is the ma driving major differences of this uh, um, between samples. So here in red, these are peripheral um, enriching peripheral blood samples, uh, where we see that it's driven by naive subtypes. You see, this is one example, you see in, in, enriching naive. Here we can see this, this part is enriching in adjacent non-tumor tissue. Um, and this part here uh, as well, and th this driven by, by TRM, T-resident memory populations. And this part here uh, is driven by, uh, by presence of uh, TX and TPEX that, that tend to co-localize, so tend to co-cure in the same samples. And this is uh, at, the, at the global level of tissue. Now we can also look at cancer, different cancer types. And we see very interesting patterns. For instance, some cancer types such as lung cancer, they are distributed in all the, the landscape of, of uh, CDA T cell composition, where others have very specific patterns. For instance, melanoma samples are enriched in the, in the TX and TPEX region where pancreatic cancers tend to be enriched in tissue resident memory and, and acute myeloid leukemia because they, these are taken from bone marrow, these are enriched in naive population. So these are just to give you an example of the kind of analysis that having this uh, automated uh, and, and consistent annotation of set types allows us to do. And finally, I wanted to say, just say some final words about how to build a reference map because I show you now uh, all the benefits of using a reference map, but unless you you will find useful the maps that we have generated for CDA, CD4 T cells, environment infection, and tumors, and one can define uh, uh, maps for any specific subtype. So we are other maps we are we are working on now are for different myeloid populations. So here's just a few words about the process of building a reference map. So three main components of these critical components are first the curation of the data. So cells, as a QC, harmonization of gene of the gene names or the, the normalization of the gene expression and the, of, of the metadata. And then about data integration, because here we have one map that is usually composed of cells coming from different studies. So here data integration is one of a, is a critical problem. And finally, the expert annotation of the populations. So about data integration, that is a critical step. Basically, what we want is to go from a situation like this one, where we see that cells really are separated by data set or study. And here, so this is the, this diff, different data set. And here, this is annotated in each data set separated different subtypes. What we want is a situation such as like this, where now cells are clustered by the phenotype and not by the study where they come from. So, in, in, and we develop a tool that is was specifically designed for a situation where the different data sets have a very large unbalance of cell, cell classes, because this is in, in our experience, this is the, what, uh, what, what we want to make a map for immune cells. This is what it happens. A different data set will have a, 
very uh, large differences between the subtype composition with sometimes very little overlap between them. So this is a method that we published some, some time ago that is called Stakas, that again is, is um, performs accurate integrations, particularly and especially, especially uh, designed for data sets that have a large cell type imbalance. And now we are um, exploring um, the use of prior knowledge to guide data integration, because most of the time we already know a lot about the cells we want to integrate. So this is just a very simple example. So these are all T cells uh, from different samples. And this is, instead of just doing a completely unsupervised integration of these different data set, we could provide some basic information, such as saying usually in, in, in this system in the periphery, we T cells are either CD4 or CD8. So we could provide, for instance, using a single cell gate, classification in two, in two groups. And then we can use this information also to help guide the data integration. So this is a new version that is already available that can be used to do this semi-supervised integration. And also how ca can this be, um, oh yeah, this, is, this is just a line of code to, to how to run it. So basically it's, it's again, can be run in, in one line. So you provide your list of objects with all the data sets you want to integrate and then the labels corresponding to the prior knowledge. So again, this can be as simple as, as uh, 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 this does not need to be a complete annotation, but whatever information you have available can help the integration process. And an important thing here is also how to measure the quality of the integration. And this is this can be a challenging problem. And here I'm just showing two two parameters that we can look at to evaluate quantitatively this. And one is the data set mixing. So this is a, a magnitude that we would like to maximize. I mean, this, in particular, we measure this for each cell type independently. We want that for each cell type, different data sets are all mixed with each other. Um, this that in, in and, and the other met, uh, metric that we are going to look at is the cell type mixing and this is something that we want to avoid we don't want that a process will bring together cells from different um from different types and usually uh, in this corner here is the is the starting point the uncorrected data which usually has a very low data set mixing because cells are really separated by data set and usually also a relatively low cell type mixing because these are these are separated by study and within each study cell types are, are, are separated so here in the in this space we could interpret this as, as the original and corrected part and then this would be the desire, desirable or, or the good region where we kept the cell type mixing low but increase the data set mixing and this would be an area of overcorrection where we have mixed the data set but at the same time we have mixed the cell types which we don't want to do so in this case, what we, we use this to compare how the, the, the different approaches uh, can help us uh, move in this space. So in this case, for instance, with this, with, with this um, what we observe is that uh, the integration with Surat CCA and Harmony did in this case an, an overcorrection. You can see here that different cell types start to be a bit mixed. Instead here, the stack as the unsupervised version did a better job and, and, and separated better the populations. But more importantly, what we could see is how the in introduction of prior knowledge affects this, this magnitude. So just by inputting the CD4, CD8 information, this moves a bit down. So meaning that the cell type mixing is, is improved. So it's, it's even better the correction. And you already see even visually in a, in a UMAP, you can, you can see the bare separation. And this gets further uh, improved when you use in for prior information for all the subtypes. So the final thing I want to show is that about to tell you about this portal that is called Spica, that is a graphical user interface to run basic reference-based analysis. So I think ideally is to do the things uh, to have the full control is to do it in in a, in in our in an R um, pipeline, uh, but this can be very useful to run a quick analysis. So this allows you to explore the, the limited number of reference maps that we have available that we are planning to, to expand with, with all the ones that we are generating and hopefully also from, from others that would like to contribute to these reference maps. And then you can also browse the, the, all the data that we have projected to this reference map. And finally, you can private in a private session, analyze your data in again for the reference map that we have already gener pre-generated. And with this, I would just have a, a few uh, take-home messages about the tools. 
The first one is that marker-based classification with single cell gate is a flexible and reproducible approach to annotate broad cell populations. Second is at a high granularity projection into expert-created reference maps. For instance, using project, this is a powerful approach to classify cells and also to interpret in a more advanced ways this data in context. And here I focus on T cell, but this is equally valid for any other uh, cell type. Then that to build reference maps from heterogeneous, in particular from heterogeneous data set, Stacas performs an accurate data integration and can also benefit from prior knowledge that uh, usually it, it is available. And finally, that uh, robust computational methods enable meta-analysis of community single cell data. And I think this is a very exciting um, uh, possibility that now we have to, to, to learn a lot from all the generated data. And we think it's very important that we can share the data and reproducible code. So with this, I would like to, again, to, to, to thank and acknowledge the, the great work from Massimo Andreata and Paul, uh, Paul Gagan, and from our collaborator, Thomas Chuchi, for the great uh, work on CD4 uh, uh, T-cell in, in, in viral infection, to Ariel Berenstein from Conicet Argentina for work in single cell gate, and Jesus Corriasoria, George Kukos, uh, for all the work in studying diversity of T-cells and Fabrice David from the work maintaining and developing the SpeakUp platform. And uh, yeah, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Santiago. Uh, that was really great. So um, you can post questions in the chat um, if you have questions for Santiago. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to start. Um, that was really fantastic. Thank you for all the development that you are doing for uh, analyzing the, all this data, data that we generate uh, in, the, in different labs. Um, my question is, uh, it's still confusing for me uh, in which case you should use um, uh, one or the other approach, like in which case you should use uh, uh, more the single cell gate or the projectiles or like how would you guide us to one or the other uh, options here yeah thank you i think it's, it's a very important point so what i would suggest is first if you can solve your problem let's say your classification problem just using markers and not in a super complicated guiding uh, gating strategy but in a relatively simple way you can solve it i would say this is the best approach because it's very simple and it's very flexible if in the case of the, for instance, studying the till diversity, or all the all the population, that was not enough. It becomes very complicated to define only based on marker genes that sometimes can be present, sometimes not. So this, in this case, considering the global transcriptional features, can be the only way. So I would say, in this, as long as it works for you, you can solve this using combination of markers. I think this is preferable, very clear, and faster to do. But yeah, if this doesn't work, then I think this is a, another approach that can then help you when you go into more detail and more subtle uh, differences. I see. And so if we go for references, um, again, how do we choose, you know, which one would like to use? I mean, I guess if I'm studying a viral infection, maybe I should use a viral generated map, but but maybe not because you showed us that the tumor and virus could be actually projected on the same um, uh, projection. So, so how could we? How do we need? How do should we choose the the, the reference that we should use in our analysis? Yeah. So I think this. I mean, this. Uh, this. I would say the answer is it depends what 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 are the questions you want to ask. So, so, so for instance, I also show you that I was using the mouse reference to project human data. So. At this level of resolution, if I just want to make this classification, let's say, of terminally exhausted, precursor exhausted, effector memory, this high level of classification, I would say it works well. It, it, it doesn't really matter. But if you're going really into the details of, let's say, this continuum from a TH1 to a TH2, I would think you, you would really need a dedicated and more context-specific map uh, to do that. So. Yeah, I think uh, it depends on what level of annotation. In general, I imagine that in most cases, one would need to generate your you, you would need to generate your own reference map for the system you are studying, um, depending also what what tissues you are interested. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you will start with those that are available for uh, let's say a global view. But then I I, I 
I think that with time, we will start to need to generate very specific maps really to focus on, on the aspects that, that we are understanding. And, and, and depending on the, on, the, on the question we have, we can also think of a more um, of, a, of a multi level approach where we start first with a more broad map and then we, we, we go into a more detailed map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, I don't see questions in the chat, so I will continue on with my own questions. Um, I have a question about um, chronotypes because you very often it's interesting to see if one cluster um, um, change to another, right? I mean, with time in different chronic infections or in the data set that you showed us, one of the question is conversion from one cluster to another. So do you have tools to to do that and to you know project chronotypes uh, across the different uh, phenotype that you find and and what is your um yeah, your yeah. I mean in the case of T cell I think this is uh, super exciting to 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 explore together with the data of the chronotype so for this we usually we use a tool that is single cell repertoire that's developed by Nick Borcherding in the in Washington University and we interface in our tool we interface with this tool so in in our in in our github repository we have some examples where we show how to combine these tools to make a clonotype combine with project tools analysis mm -hmm. so we did actually that for the analysis of cd4 showing mainly that the different actually most of the clonotypes did not have a preference for either th1 or tfh like 90 more than 90 percent of the clonotypes were distributed as by, by randomly between the two and there were some clonotypes that showed up a preference and this so this can be yeah the code for that is available so there are very good tools to combine and uh, the two things yeah let's say to, right. you, you you could project it take each clonotype at a time and focus in after the projection where where it go and how it is and on and, and what is the and measure the bias is it biased towards one phenotype or is it distributed as expected from the from the baseline distribution. So these these tools are already implemented and yeah. Okay. Can Great. Be used. Fantastic. So we have uh, two questions. Sorry. Um uh, can I ask a question really quick? Yes, sure. Uh, Santiago, thanks for that uh, beautiful talk. Uh, so how do you uh, in terms of data integration in different studies given, you know, probably differences in different versions or platforms and sequencing depth uh, levels with protein um, expression combined. How do you like within data integration? How do you compare to that to not allow for certain data sets to sort of bias the overall conclusions in a meta analysis? Yeah. So here, uh, no. It's, it's, I mean, this is a this is a big challenge. No, data integration is not. Uh, um, is 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 not a let's say a, a fully solved problem. So there are there are many many challenges, and that that is one of those. First, I would for, about the protein. I would say that here I was talking about integration of the transcriptome, right? Like most of the data is transcriptomic, so we are doing the integration of the transcriptomic level. If it's a multiomics analysis, it can come along with other multi other modalities, but but here we are really doing integration at the transcript at the transcriptomics level. And here I would separate the problem in, 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 in how to build the reference. So there you need a quite good integration, uh, but to, to have a, a, an accurate map. And so there I would say it, is, it would be better uh, to select data sets that, that are quite compatible um, in terms of integration and not the extreme cases where you have, I mean, rare technology. So most of the, the data comes from 10x chromium, three prime, five prime. So combining these two and maybe some plate-based technologies can be good. So I would say for the reference map, I would say it's better to use more compatible and similar data. But then what we found is that even if you build this at the level, at the, at the part of projecting external data, projection is very robust to different technologies. So we did test, but let's say if we build a map with a 10X data and then we project SmartSig2 data or, or in-drop data, and, and we found a, 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 a really good uh, classification performance, meaning that the method then for correcting batch effects and, and projection from a query data set to the reference works quite well across technologies. So I'll say that one needs to be very careful to select which data sets and technologies want to use to build a reference map. Usually we, we are mostly building the maps with 10x, but then 
we can project data from other technologies. Thank you. Thank you. So we have questions in the chat. Um, we have a question from Du who is asking that the same cell type may be exposed to different microenvironment. Um, based on the single cell RNA seq data, is there a way to infer the heterogeneity of the environment or state of the same classified cell type? Yeah, yeah, this is a great point. And in fact, yeah, this is uh, one of the advantages of doing this because when you look at all, when you look at an unsupervised analysis, all the signals together, it is hard to know what signals come, let's say, from the environment and, and stimuli from the environment and come from, a, let's say, a subtype specific signal. So by doing this, by first separating by the different, let's say, uh, subtypes in, in, or, or broad, more broadly defined subtypes, then we can compare each of them in different conditions, for instance, different tissues. And we we did that in in the two in the, in the both papers of the of the TIL map and the and the CD4 map. For instance, we compare uh, uh, same subtype from different tissues, and then you can see uh, what are the differences. And sometimes the differences can be can be shared across across the subtypes, as we as I show you this tissue residency program that was present in the lung from both TH1 and TFH, but also sometimes some programs are specific to the subtype. So in the case of CD8, virus specific CD8 T cells in a data set that we reanalyzed from, from the group of Annette Oxinius, what we found is that there were some, some tissue specific signals of, C, of virus specific T cells that were associated with certain subtype, for instance, the, the TX. So I think, yeah, this is, uh, and, and it's implemented with this discriminant analysis. So these are the, the very interesting questions that I think are are easier now to address. Once one we, once we have control for the main, main variation, then we can ask this also, how many, which cells are cycling in each subtype, which cells are responding to interferon, which is another very strong signal, um, yeah. So this can be like a downstream analysis uh, for, for, for gene signatures. Right, very nice. Um, there is another question from Mohamed Abdelakim. Uh, for the LCMV experiments, where these endogenous tetramer positive GP33, GP66 cells or transgenic P14, SMARTA? Smarter, right? No, these these were uh, these were GP sixty six tetramer sorted cells. So these were um, this was critical to do the TCR analysis because so these are endogenous responses. So you can see really the diversity of the TCRs. However, for instance, the the data that I show you from the uh, paper from Snell that they did immune uh, PDA one blockade. These were smarter cells that then were projected into the tetramer sorted cells, and we found very nice very, very nice profiles. So. This was also quite nice to see that actually the phenotypes acquired by the smart cells were very, very, uh, almost indistinguishable from those of the of the GP66 sorted uh, CD4 T cells. Great, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for um, the seminar and uh, the great discussion. And uh, have a great evening here. <laughs> Thank you very much.